Welcome to another round of Salty Takeaways and Bitter Ends. And I don't know how many Bitter Ends we'll have after a win over Inter-Miami by the score of 2-0. John here, Jared there. And um, this one was, it, it had a bunch of different subplots to it, most of them having to do with the way that Inter-Miami felt compelled to play coming into Mercedes-Benz. But uh, Atlanta United, this was one of those matches, Jared, where you sit there and you go, yeah, this is one that you should have. Atlanta United, prohibitive favorite in the juice boxes, I think, at a minus 182. And they got the job done at the end of the day, full points on a match at home that they needed. It was. It's pretty cut and dry. It's a match that you needed to win. It's a match that, that, that frankly, that you needed because of the way it went. You get an early goal. <clears throat> Miami gets out of their own minds. Uh, they get a red card before the 30th minute. They're not really pressuring. I think their XG was like 0.8 on the day. Um and then you get a late goal from Joseph. You created plenty of chances, and it never really felt like Miami was gonna was gonna bite you, you know. And it's the kind of game you needed. You needed a game where it it wasn't super stressful. And yeah, sure, like a tight, tough win can build character and scar tissue. But sometimes, man, it's nice to not have to stress over a win and just get a comfortable win to say, hey. Look what we are capable of doing, jumping out in front of somebody, putting them under pressure, forcing them into mistakes, and then coasting. That's exactly what you needed, and it's exactly what you got. Also let you rest some legs where um, – we've talked – I've talked about this before. It's the same concept, and, John, you can chime in on this as well with pitching, where, mm-hmm. where somebody can throw 100 pitches versus somebody throwing 80 pitches, and it can have different amounts in the tank based on the stress of the pitches, You know, high leverage situations, low leverage situations. Joseph can play 90 minutes in a game where he's able to just make those runs because they're not getting threatened going the other way as much. And is able, and you got guys, not just Joseph, but you got guys on the field who they're not having to dig, dig as deep. They're not trying to rescue something, you know, that, that does make a difference on your legs and on your brain. Atlanta United, I think the word that comes to mind for me today is that they made life uncomfortable for inter Miami with the pressure that they were able to exert and all Inter-Miami ended up trying to do was send it long, chase after it, hope they can get something in transition instead of trying to build because Atlanta United wasn't allowing them to do that over a full, well, I guess, you know, we could sit here and say over a full 30 minutes and then plus another 60 minutes if you want to take the Mota cards and have them as the two separate stages of the match. Yeah, that one, and even the, we can talk about the Mota cards for a second, because th- there was a lot of discussion about, you know, um, you know, about whether the second one is a foul or not, and it's, it's soft to me, but by the book, it's, it's foul, mm-hmm. and it's, it's, it is, you know, trying to stop a breakaway, and even though there's two guys there who, and that's what made it dumb to me for Mota, is like, you didn't have to make that decision, like, you had two guys flanking him 10 yards in front of him, they were going to be able to close it down. You didn't have to commit that foul because it is a foul. And it's one of those, don't put the situation in the referee's hands. You just had a yellow. There have been a lot of hard challenges early in that game. Uh, Taylor Twelman talked about it on the broadcast that, you know, th- those felt like the kinds of challenges that a team that is second best on the day makes where they're frustrated because they're the second best team on the day so far. You know, they have the bad turnover that leads to the goal and they were just getting frustrated in their challenges. But you don't give, you don't put the referee in a position like that where he can throw that second yellow right after you've had the first one, not what, 10 minutes before? I yeah. mean, it was it's, it's, two cards in three minutes for Mota. Oh, yeah, it was three minutes. Um, it, it don't give him the, ch- don't, don't put it in the referee's hands. It was a stupid challenge. And, and Phil Neville can get as mad as he wants to the referees when he's talking at halftime. Um, think he's mad as he wants about it, but don't you know, batter your player. Your player's the one that let you down. It reminds me a bit of uh, uh, LGP in the 2019 U.S. Open Cup final against Minnesota, where he has those two quick fouls and gets sent off, and it's unnecessary stress for Atlanta United in that game. Um, it, it, you're not helping your team when you do that, when you lose your mind like that, and it was just, again, yeah, it's don't don't make those decisions. And at the same time, I thought that Damian Lowe was orange card material, or at least yellow. He was, he was yellow plus, I guess. You know, when you look at what 
Damian Lowe. I mean, I thought that Damian Lowe should have had uh, you know, persistent infringement. I thought that he should have been uh, on the wa- on the watch as well when it came to Inter Miami possibly being two men down by the end of it all. Yeah, he could have been. Um, and you're gonna. I'm gonna be interested to see what Disco says to see if he should be uh, suspended a game because after the game, Dumb. Uh, exactly. Yeah, Dom Dwyer is what he is. We've talked about this before. I love Dom Dwyer because Dom Dwyer is that guy that when he's on your team, you love him, and when he's not, you hate him. So his his actions towards Dom, it's a little bit of a head bob forward. It's inter. I'll be interested to see how they rule on it. Will it be a? Well, they just they decided. I guess it wasn't a red card in the moment. Uh, the dog agrees out here with uh with the ruling. I think on the field. But yes. will it be a red? Um, will it, or will it be a one game suspension, or will they just let it go? Because it's such a dumb decision at the end of the game like that. Don't don't bob your head forward in that situation. You're you're playing into what a guy like Dwyer is trying to get out of you. Let's go through the they, they were going at it too. It looked like I think Absolutely. somebody said Dom Dom basically told him, like, we can meet in the tunnel. <laughs> and look, for all of the shit talking that Dom does and the shit housery that Dom does, I don't know if y'all have ever stood next to Dom Dwyer. Dom Dwyer physically is not somebody that I'm gonna square up with. I don't know how good or bad of a fighter he is, but he's incredibly solidly built. I don't want to have to find that out. Let's go through the numbers, courtesy of our friends at SofaScore on the day, as to how they looked at things. The overall number is 7.22 for Atlanta United versus a 6.46 for Inter Miami. Uh, your player ratings, a lot of sevens, a couple of eights for Atlanta United. Eights, obviously, Joseph Martinez and Luis Arrugio, 8-4 and 8-5. Uh, Marcelino Moreno, Ronaldo Cisneros, both were below seven. Everybody else that started was a seven. Emerson Heinemann, a 7-1. Ibarra was a 0.5. Brooks was a 7-0. Alan Franco, a 7-8. George Campbell, 7-9. Caleb Wiley, 7-1. Rocco Rios Novo, 7.5. Rob Valentino was uh, the press conference since he was the coach for the day because of the uh, Gonzalo Pineda red card suspension. Uh, So it was uh, Rob on the sidelines. And when you got to catch up with him, One of the first questions you ask about the young guys, Caleb Wiley, George Campbell, Rocco Rios Novo. So when I mentioned Caleb Wiley, George Campbell, Rocco Rios Novo, what did you think of them on the day? I thought they were brilliant. Um, I thought they did exactly what you needed of them. Um, Look, we can think back to the game that uh, Campbell had against Miami in Miami where he was where he was really bad. Um, But. You can you can think about those games all you want, but games like you had today are why you keep playing him so he can show those performances like he had today. Caleb Wiley was insanely good, um, even with uh, George Bellow in the building. And then you know, Rocco had one or two moments where you were where he gets a little sideways on you, where you're thinking, I don't know if he knows where he how, how risky he's getting, but I think he always has good control of the situation. And it was fun to see George Campbell uh, showing off a little bit, you know, with uh, getting engaged and going forward and uh, ha- had uh, got to show a bit, little bit of the skill uh, for a forward player. For, uh, when it, I thought, I thought it, was, it was fun at moments when he got those moments to move forward and be active and involved in the play in addition to how he was closing things down at the back. So it was, uh, I thought it was a really well-rounded and at times fun watch looking at George Campbell in the afternoon. It was, and Alan Franco was also really, really good in this game. Both of the center backs did a great job and gave you what you needed on the day and did a great job of keeping, uh, you want to remove hope yes. from a team like Miami. Like It's great to get that early goal. What they did to Miami is what I wanted them to do. Um one of them to do to Columbus and it went literally the other way is you want a team that wants to play packed in like that, get up on them early, make them have to come out of their shell. And then when they try have your center backs, just kind of bat things away like a mosquito. <laughs> All right, let's get into the numbers, the individual numbers for uh, George Campbell and Alan Franco and Caleb Wiley. Since you mentioned them, let's go uh, George Campbell, three clearances, a block. Uh, uh, and it was uh yeah, that was a uh, a block that I'm sure George Campbell was feeling for quite some time after the the block was experienced. Uh, two interceptions, five tackles, two dribbles passed, six of ten on his ground duels, over one in the air. So six of eleven on his duels on the day. 
Uh, 77 touches. All right, now this is this I did not know until I just uh, had the numbers dialed up here. Passing on the day for George Campbell, 61 passes, 60 completions, 98% in his accurate passing uh, in his passing accuracy on the day on 77 touches, two key passes, two for two on his long balls, a shot on target, and one for one on his dribble. 60 of 61 for George Campbell on the day. And, and I know that the final, dog will hunt. Yeah, and I know that the final 60 minutes probably had a lot to do with it, but still, 98%, you take it and you run. Alan Franco on the day as his 7.8. Four clearances, three blocks, two interceptions, a tackle. The only thing missing is the partridge in the pear tree. I guess we get that in December. Three of four on his ground duels, one for one in the air. So on the day, he was, uh, let's see, he's four for five on his duels. Uh, fouled once, 91% completion on 74 passes on 89 touches. He had a shot blocked and one for one on his dribbles as well. Caleb Wiley on the day. It was uh, 85 minutes for Caleb, two interceptions, four tackles, two dribbles. He was six for nine in his duels on the day. 77% passing on the left for Caleb Wiley on 61 touches, 34 of 44. Shot on target, shot blocked. He hit the hit the woodwork once officially and a big chance missed. But you've got 77% from Caleb Wiley, 98% from George Campbell, 91% from Alan Franco at the back. Uh, somebody else, uh, I know that uh, when, I'm going to drift back here a little bit. Same lineup that came out against Pachuca, which meant that you had the, uh, the Fantastic Four up top, but you also had Heinemann and Ibarra as your, your two starting yeah, uh, in the the midfield that were working behind the uh, the uh, the four in the attack. Obviously, Mateus is set you dealing with heavy legs. That's why he didn't play against Pachuca, and so that was why he was brought in as a substitute. But Emerson Heinemann and Franco Ibarra, what do you think of that combo? I thought it was really good. Um, it's it's a bit of a change of pace from what you've seen with Sasetu. Um, I think uh, Heinemann's a bit more of a guy who wants to get forward and get. And, and play forward as opposed to playing metronome. Right. And you know, he's capable of doing that and he's capable of causing problems. Uh, we've seen Emerson, Emerson Hyman do it in spurts before. And he's been one of those guys that I think has really dealt with some bad luck, um, especially the last two plus years. You know, he started off the 2020 season, two goals in two games, was playing really well. COVID shuts everything down. He gets COVID and was never really the same player after that. Exactly. Um, played well at times last year under Gabriel Heinze and then blows his ACL. And it felt like he was on a good run when that happened. Now he's back, working his way back into fitness, and in a very impressive way, like playing really well. Um, you know, his, uh, depending on what happens going forward, I think it's not going to be a lack of what he does. It's going to be what Jose Tu gives you and what you need on the day. I mean, the, the that midfield rotation might be different. It might be different on Ibarra's part when you get Sosa back in the fray. Um, you know, they're, they're different kinds of players, but Barra has continued to grow and continue to be fantastic. And it's, is you know, that kind of, I don't want to call him a destroyer, like a ball winner, destroyer kind of dude. Who's he's going to win. He's going to win that ball in the midfield. He's going to protect his back line. And it's very fun. And they've, they've built that chemistry that you want to see of when someone goes, someone stays. And, you know, it, it was impressive to see today. I'm glad for Emerson that he was able to do it. Because you know he worked his ass off. They all do. Uh, but especially coming back from an ACL tear like that, uh, we've talked about it before, that it's as much of a mental thing as a physical thing to trust your body and trust your knee. Also getting some time, uh, Mikey Ambrose came in for five minutes to sub for Caleb Wiley. Marsadic came in for Franco Ibarra, gave you 12-plus, the six at the end. And uh, you know, we mentioned Hasechu and Dwyer. Let's go to the net. Rocco Rios Novo in his first MLS start punched a 7.5. Here's some of his numbers on the day. Three saves, not really challenged a whole lot. Uh, Anything that was coming at him, uh, he had the one punch save in the first half, but not really challenged, had everything pretty much under control. Uh, 34 touches, 19 of 22 in his passing for 86%, 2 of 4 on his long balls on the day. So, uh, yeah, Rocco Rios Novo, who at times was your third center back, and I'm sure caused some folks to sit there and look at it with a bit of a raised eye. But Rocco Rios Novo punches a 7.5. What'd you think? I thought Rocco was good. Um, like I said, a couple of moments where you know he's he's in possession, which is what he's going to do. He's probably going to dribble his way out of 90% of those or punt it into row X. Um, a couple of moments where he gets a little like, 
he doesn't mm-hmm. get to take, uh, be, please be careful, but he's still a very good shot stopper. Um, they put a couple shots on him, but everything was pretty much right at him. I mean, you have the one after Atlanta scores that I think it's Vasilev puts it over the bar. Um, yeah, I think you're right. It's, it's a good opportunity for Miami. Otherwise, when they're just trying to bomb it, you know, they get a couple that fall to like Campania and he like puts a shot literally right on uh, Rocco's head. So like Last Rocco just basically drops the left. Yeah, that was. Yeah, the- like it's but it's, it's it's never really bothering him. And he does well with it. And then, yeah, he, he wants to basically play as another center back when when he's not literally standing in his goal saving shots. I mean, he's not going to stand back there. It's not it's not like a and we talk about like goalkeepers and the way they play now with their feet. He's not that traditional style though of well, I could say neo traditional, I guess, of he can play with his feet, but he's gonna stay in his he's gonna stay in his eighteen and mostly in his six. And you can use him as an outlet and to play it back and he'll just shift the field. Oh um, man, he's gonna come out of his eighteen if he wants to. He's gonna sweep on it. He has zero fear about that sort of thing. But I think he also trusts his back line. And I think I would think that last year, him playing with George Campbell with the second team really did help in that rapport that they were able to have together. And then Alan Franco putting together such a really solid performance surely made it easier on everybody else. Same with Caleb Wiley being over on the left-hand side as well uh, as part and parcel to all of this. But yeah, Rocco Rios Nova, like I said, 19 of 22, not really challenged, had a couple of saves, a couple of easy hops, great distribution on the day. So it was good to see that as well. Just to give you the uh, the numbers for uh, Inter-Miami, and no real surprise, uh, you had in, in, the, in the breakdown there, you had uh, Mota, who ended up with uh, a 4.7 because of the uh, the two cards. Happens when you play 30 minutes and get two yellows in five minutes. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Robert Taylor in the middle had a 5.9. A lot of sixes across the board. Drake Callender had a 7.3. Uh, you know, the three substitutions. Emerson, who came in for... Uh, uh, 74 minutes before Taylor came in. Uh, Victor Uyoa came in, and uh, Kieran Gibbs came in for the final 10 as well. But Jean Mota had a disastrous day at a 4.7. It's one of the lowest numbers I think I've seen in Sofa Score when it comes to what we've seen from Inter Miami. But when you look at Inter Miami, uh, I'm going to take the Mota yellows out of the equation. When you look at Inter Miami, Jared, you know, right now in the standings in MLS, after today, in the East, Inter Miami, 5-3-7 and seven at 18 points. They played one match more than Atlanta United. Goal difference of minus nine. They had a four-game winless streaks, uh, winning streak, or unbeaten streak snapped. Two draws. They had a two-game win streak snapped. The 2-0 win over Red Bulls and the 2-1 win over Portland. Both of those were in Fort Lauderdale, by the way. So they took care of business at home. Then they come on the road. Lose 2-0 to Inter-Miami. When you look at Inter-Miami on the day, right now 10th in the East after action, Jarrett, what comes to mind when you look at Inter-Miami now? Uh, allegedly, they got some signings coming in and they need them Um, They because one of their issues is depth. Uh, we saw it today when they don't have, uh, you know, uh, Gregor in the... Uh, you don't have the, Gregory. Yeah, here's your, you don't have Gregory in the 18. Here's your bench on the day. Here's your bench on the day. Yeah. Clement Giop in net. Jairo Quinteros, Kieran Gibbs, Ryan Saylor, Victor Ulloa, Emerson, Gonzalo Higuain, who did not play, and and Edison Ascona. That was your bench on the day for Inter Miami. Yeah, you don't have Gregory to be that guy to kind of help things along in the middle. It kind of feels similar, not the exact same, to a problem that Sporting Kansas City had. Where you don't have somebody play that six role in that system. Ah, you're missing that guy that you need to be the fulcrum. You don't have uh, somebody else to do that job. That's where that depth comes into play, and this is where Miami gets hurt. This is where a team like Charlotte could potentially get hurt if they have injuries, is when you're missing guys. You don't have someone of the the same quality to step in and be able to do the job. You're going to have days like this you know, where you make a mistake in the back, and then all of a sudden you're down one nothing on the road, and Atlanta's trying to, like, you know, basically trying to commit psychological warfare on you with all the turnovers and the pressure. And then you snap, somebody does something stupid. Whoops, you're down a man. Not every game for them is going to go like this. Of course, just like not every game for Atlanta was going to go like the Columbus game, but it's, it's going to be something that they're going to have to look back on and think, you know, okay, we got it. We're going to have to, 
use our limited resources this year and next year and find some depth pieces for that. Now, it sounds like they have a couple of TAM signings coming in, which should be able to give them a bit of a boost. Because, but right now, it, it feels like that offense is as Campania goes. That's how they go. And Atlanta limited him to some pretty tame chances. And he's able to create some chances and good on it for it. Mm-hmm. But... It's, I mean, you don't, you don't have those, de- you don't have that depth and you get those injuries. Ask Atlanta what happens when you, when you just keep having, you know, guys miss time. Here's your Campana numbers, by the way, in 90 minutes, he only had, he had no shots on target, two shots off target, one block. That was the Campbell block that we talked about earlier in the show. Oh, for one on his dribbles. 29 touches for Leo Campana on the day, even though he was 13 of 14 passing. Two for uh, 10 in his duels. Two for 10. Eight times he loses possession, fouled once, had a clearance, had a block, three dribbles passed, but only 29 touches on the day for Leo Campana, or for Leo Campana, obviously after uh, the Mota second yellow and the red, you know, things kind of changed a little bit for Inter Miami, but on the day, trying to create didn't happen with Campana with 29 touches on the day for him. But one of the guys that you know you've got to clamp down on to beat uh, Inter Miami and Atlanta United did exactly that by the score of 2 0. Last time that they're going to be home for a while, they've got uh, Toronto coming up next. And that one is coming up next Saturday, the 25th. Then in quick succession, it's the two matches. To finish June and start July, it is at Red Bulls on the 30th at night, a Thursday night match, June the 30th, and then Sunday afternoon in uh, somewhere in the five boroughs to take on NYC on July 3rd. So it's going to be three on the road for Atlanta United before they come back home July the 9th when people start chanting Verde and Listos in the 200s when Austin uh, FC comes to town. So... Uh, As we put a wrap on this one, Jarrett, for another round of salty takeaways, not a whole lot to be salty about, but if there was anything to be salty about, what do you think it would be? Um, man, I'm really tired of listening to Taylor Twelman call games, um, because (laughs) I feel like Taylor Twelman either isn't doing his research or doesn't pay attention to it because I, I don't want to keep hearing about, uh, I don't, I keep, I, I'm tired of hearing about things outside of context. Like, yes, uh, we know Miami had more wins coming into this game than Atlanta this year. Uh, Atlanta's also suffered an obscene number of injuries to the spine of their team. And it feels like only in the last two weeks have people really acknowledged that. But I mean, come on, you got to have that conversation. Joseph Martinez is finally healthy after going through arthroscopic knee surgery again. Uh, you're missing the U.S. national team center back. You're missing your starting goalkeeper. You're missing your guy who was your six early in the year. You're, you, missing a lot of guys and mm-hmm. you're just now starting to get it back. Now you were missing, uh, uh, Almada today. Yeah. Due to his suspension. Like uh, I'm, t- I'm tired of it just being like, y'all just do your research about, about the rosters and the injuries, please. That's yeah. Really? I'm just begging you to do it. And yeah, like great. Miami didn't completely collapse and give up five goals. Okay, great. But just, just do the damn research on it. I'm tired. Of, I'm tired of listening to it all without context. And I will say this though: I think that uh, once the Mota second yellow got them down to ten men, I think they completely became discombobulated. I, I think that uh, there were some rash challenges afterwards, and I think they became clearly emotionally rattled after that second, after the second yellow and the send off because they were down to 10 and you saw how much they were trying to, to crowd around and try to influence a decision, perhaps getting a card for Atlanta United. But you no, know, I, I think that there are some things that you've got to talk about inside the locker room in situations like this, where you've got to keep your cool and enter Miami did not do that. No, they did not. Um, and that's, it's, it's going to be a part of it. Sometimes when things start not going your way very quickly, it's very easy to lose your head in those situations. And they weren't able to keep theirs in that moment. They didn't completely collapse. You know, they create a couple half chances in the second half. Atlanta eventually puts them away, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's exactly how you don't want the game to go when you're, when you're going to be sitting deep and visiting a team, you don't want to give up that early goal. You won't, don't want it to be sloppy. Um, no one got, seriously hurt it seems like so everyone was able to walk off the field um 
still am interested to like see if we find out more information about the the Dwyer Low argument. Keep an eye um, on Friday news dump from Disco. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, we'll see. Disco is completely unreliable. There's no way to know with them. Um, but yeah, it's 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 one of those things though that ultimately this was. It's the kind of win you needed. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth Mm -hmm. and you can critique it for sure and say, okay, next time can we see about doing this? Or I'd like to see them improve on this, but at the same time, enjoy the win because it's a lot damn better than the alternatives. Yes, absolutely. So that is our our round of salty takeaways and bitter wins after the two nil win goals by Luis and Joseph to give Atlanta United full points in a home match before three on the road at Toronto and then the two in the New York area coming up to the end of June and the early part of July. So that is your early rundown of everything that we thought of in looking at Atlanta United and Inter-Miami. We'll go over it again on Monday morning, starting at 9.05 here on the network. It'll be Jason and Jarrett and me, and we will go over anything else on your mind. So you can follow us on the the Twitch pitch at twitch.tv slash soccer down here. Don't forget to reach out to us on the Twitters at Soccer Down Here at OSG Nelson at Jared underscore Smith and at Longshoe. For all of us here at SDH, it's another round of Salty Takeaways. We'll catch up with you Monday morning.